Thank you, Ellen and Helen. <laughs> um, we are we're, we're running late, um, but we we have time for um, a few questions and discussion. Um, this does sound like a really exciting exhibition, and it's going to be so interesting to see the paintings next to these actual objects that he painted from, and as you say, to see the liberties that he took um, in transforming them into paint. Um, my question is about, um, is, do you see any, and this is for both of you, do you see any difference between the way that he translated objects into paint that he collected versus objects that he made himself? Like for, you know, his own, his own paintings when he paints, or sculptures that he made when he, when he does a painting of these things that, it, that are physical things in the world. Is there, is there a difference in his approach? That's a good question. I mean, I'm immediately, uh, you know, thinking of how many times um, the sculpture Reclining Nude appears in his paintings, and we have a little group yep. um, in the exhibition that's fo focused on um, how his own sculpture appears uh, in his paintings, because obviously the objects in his studio were also his own. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that he probably, if I had to kind of sum up a, a general principle, I mean, he's probably more comfortable um, um, depicting his own works directly. I mean, the painting that Ellen showed us, the still life with the African statuette um, that has the uh, Vili figure in it, one of his first acquisitions, um, is really rare in his work. He very lit I mean, there's another one here in the Barnes collection where he you know, has the, the Bamana on the, on the chimney on the mantelpiece. Um, but he very rarely directly uh, depicts African sculpture in his work. Um, sometimes, obviously, we, you know, in the Nice periods, you see much more kind of direct transcription of the objects. Um, and uh, it's my feeling, I mean, this is, was Jack Flam who said this, you know, I, I think he's sort of suspicious of using the power of African art in that kind of literal mm -hmm. way. Um, and it could be one of the reasons why the painting was left unfinished. But he's much more comfortable, obviously, depicting his own works in that literal way. And I think with the African objects in particular, he doesn't want to be overwhelmed by their, um, their presence in his work. Mm -hmm. And so he sort of uses the concepts from them instead. Hmm. You buy that, Helen? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes? Um, have you shed any information about the process of the paper cutting? Um, Can you shed any information on the process of the paper cutting? Um, what kind of paper was used? Did he paint on it before he cut it? How was it hung? You, oh, you mean like a, a summary of the whole cutout project? I mean, anything. Uh, okay. <laughs> I feel like a Pez dispenser. All right, um, so, uh, I mean, there are other people who are, who are well, so far more versed here in the audience of the, about Matisse's cutout projects that I have. It's Carl Bookman here. Jody Hopman is going to be talking about it tomorrow. It, if you come tomorrow, you are going to get a, a lovely overview. Um, but the uh, cutouts, did we show any cutouts? We showed cutouts, yeah. Um, you know, largely painted on, with, on, with gouache. Painted and then cut? Yep. <laughs> oh. oh, sorry. Go. Okay. All right. Why don't you, sorry, you, you do it? Um, Cezanne had, of course, his fetish with his objects. To what extent, and painted the same things over and over and over again, to what extent do you think that perhaps this practice on Matisse's part was emulative of, his, of the man he believed you know, was the father of us all? Sure. I mean, I think in general, just a, a sort of deep and sustained meditative looking at things, not just objects. Cezanne is a primordial example of that for Matisse. I mean, this is something that all artists do, right? I mean, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure that he is, Cezanne is one of many artists that he is thinking of with the engagement with objects. Uh -huh. You know, to follow up by the, the, one of the questions that always preoccupied me, which is scale, I'm just, it's a question for the two of you, actually. In, when, when Matisse uses uh, some of these objects and, and trans, you know, transpose them, you know, the, the, 
the textile uh, from uh, Africa or his own sculptures or all these pots that he seems to uh, like so much. I'm just wondering to know the concept of consistency of scale between between paintings because I, I was very surprised to see the, the the for the first time I saw this image of the I think it was, I never saw it before I don't at least I don't remember of the Egyptian curtain the real one to see actually how big it was by you know so it, there is a consistency of scale he kept he he, he was. It was true to the size of the Egyptian curtain, Egyptian curtain in the painting, which actually, I, I didn't, I, I, you know, I didn't know that it was this, pen, this textile was so big. So I was just wondering, is he, is he moving? From, is he trans, you know, changing the size of this object, or is he s staying basically uh, true to them, or, you know, does he use the object to play with, his, you know, scale and whatever? I mean, I'm just. Just, I'm curious about it because I never really saw much of the, the object themselves. So that's a good question. I mean, I think that um, I think that there's a difference when he uses objects uh, and kind of appropriates design pr principles, and I think he gets ideas about scale from certain objects. Certainly, you know that that stunning Samoan tapa that uh, that Ellen showed us. And the sort of ways in which, like, you know, size is different than scale, right? And the, how um, it affects sort of the space around it. But then when he's depicting objects, which is a different thing, by and large, he pretty much stays to the the, the quote unquote correct proportion of the object. I have a vague memory of the that he just shrank in one of his paintings, which is a large sculpture that he is one of the. Oh, yeah. 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 And then there's that, the, the lilacs from the Metropolitan where you see the, the, the little crouching nude, you know, and like dwarfed, you know, by this amazing um, still life. Well, there's also so, the, 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 uh, the, what do you call it? The big, huge portrait of the family upstairs, the music lesson. Yeah. Where he blows up the sculpture. Right. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. a good question. Uh, mine is just an observation that I really never picked up with Matisse when you mentioned the object and how it's related to the odalisque. It just reflects back on how Dr. Barnes, with his furniture and his pottery and his ironworks, is reflected in his paintings that he hangs next to him. Um, Barnes got many of his uh, African pieces from Paul Guillaume. Was Matisse also buying from Guillaume, or did he get his African pieces from another source? We don't know exactly where Matisse uh, have bought his pieces, um, but uh, we have some indications. Uh, he bought his first African sculpture uh, by Emile Mann uh, called Père Sauvage in Paris, in, in the Rue de Rennes. Uh, it's, what, it's written in the letters, um, so there is no doubt, uh, but uh, there is close ties with Paul Guillaume in 1917. He laid his Bamana sculpture for, for this book um, entitled uh, Les Sculptures Negres. Uh, it was the first book who showed um, African sculpture as works uh, of art. And um, there is any, some indication in the letters from the Barnes Foundation in the archives, uh, we can um, uh, read that Matisse uh, and Guillaume uh, met them in Nice, and uh, Guillaume spoke about a, a big collection of African art, and Guillaume may have bought um, sculptures uh, to, um, to Matisse, it's possible. Uh, Brumart too, 
uh, Proma was uh, a major dealer uh, for Parisian uh, market. Um, we have we have some informations. Hmm. Maybe one more question. Okay. Oh, one more. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, there's Margaret. <laughs> one more. <laughs> this is just a question, I guess, for Ellen probably. Um, I, I, I'm just trying to tie together some of the ideas that have been discussed today, and I was thinking particularly of Cameron's talk and your talk. And I'm wondering, there seems to be such an incredibly deliberate process, especially with the indirect borrowings of some of the textiles, but also the arrangement of the objects that he's, you know, collecting. And I just, I'm trying to figure out what the balance is between this very deliberate manipulation of objects and trans of them into pictures, and this other kind of movement towards something that's more dreamlike or uh, like automatic drawing, which is what Cameron was talking about, or some sort of more instinctual kind of way in which Matisse really talks about what he does. Mm. So I think that also might even speak to some of your thoughts about where your exhibition is going to end up in terms of, you know, how do you think about this? How do you think about the fact that the objects are now put in a much bigger cultural context. And what exactly is he doing with these things if he's not continuing an, you know, a kind of orientalist exploitation of them, or however you want to think about that. So I'm just, I'm just wondering about that balance between instinct and improvisation and very deliberate collecting and arrangement mm. and quotation. That's a really good question. And then I, um, would want to think more about it. But I guess my quick answer is that um, it has always uh, struck me that Matisse's very deliberate working methods um, is the foundation for his abilities to be instinctual. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you um, to all of our speakers.